thank you for the introduction and thank you for the organizers to provide me an opportunity here to talk on this topic. Um, specifically, I will be talking about uh, assessments of arterial stiffness with quantitative MRI uh, with, uh, and will have a focus on uh, pulse wave velocity measures for that. Uh, and in the end of the talk, I hope you understand why uh, you want, might want to do that and how you would do that. More specifically, I have here a list of what I want to cover. I want to go through the biological relevance, um, talk about the basic method for pulse wave velocity assessment with 2D phase contrast MRI, uh, and uh, cover the analysis methods used to derive these measures, potential pitfalls, and then I have a few selected MRI methods to improve on the, uh, on the basic processing. Um, I think we're all familiar uh, with, with the function of the aorta to supply, uh, transmit and distribute blood from the heart to the rest of the body. Um, other functions that are not so often mentioned are that it, it also buffers pulse style forces from the left ventricular contraction. So that's known as the Windkessel principle. And uh, the purpose is to have a more cons constant rather than pulsatile blood flow to the peripheral vessels. Um, it also limits augmentation phenomenon from reflective pressure waveforms. We heard a little bit about reflective waves in the previous talk. Um, so you, you might have heard about the terms of ventricular arterial coupling that's involved in that and the effects of ventricular afterloads. Uh, most of my talk, I will talk about atherosclerosis um, as uh, uh, motivation to conduct um, arterial stiffness measures, but uh, uh, these factors that I just showed you here um, are other motivations. So there are diseases like bicuspid uh, aortic valve, uh, Marfan syndrome, uh, pulmonary hypertension, if you look at the right side of the heart, where stiffness measures are also of interest. should also be noted that uh, the um, the aorta has evolved uh, 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 to adapt the, the cardiovascular system to these functions. So uh, if you look at histology, it, it varies not only from the aorta to more distal uh, um, medium-sized arteries, it also varies within the, uh, the histology also varies within the length of the artery itself. Um, as I mentioned, I will uh, talk a lot about atherosclerosis, um, a very common uh, factor in cardiovascular disease that usually develops subclinically over decades. If you look at the time scale here of this uh, plot, on the right, um, it stretches over four decades from uh, initial lesions uh, to, to complicated lesions uh, that we often detect very late. Um, the, the remodeling of the vascular wall happens such that it uh, grows outwards first in the formation of atherosclerotic plaques. It even widens the lumen of the vessel often instead of uh, the, the more uh, familiar state that we see in angiography images where the vessel uh, is, the lumen is decreased because of the growth of the atherosclerotic plaque into the vessel and eccentric formation of the vessel wall. Uh, we are not that perfect in assessing cardiovascular disease uh, at this point, uh, in, especially in earlier stages. Uh, some common methods are the framing and risk score, which is uh, shown here all kind of factors that go into that without imaging, um, coronary calcium scoring with CT, intermediate thickness, vessel wall imaging, which we will hear much more about this afternoon. Um, the premise of arterial stiffness measures is that it can possibly detect earlier changes in cardiovascular disease before there are uh, geometric changes in the vessel that we can detect with the imaging method that I just mentioned before. So we can we have the potential to see those uh, mechanical changes in the vessel wall in earlier stages, which would be greatly beneficial if we want to intervene in that chain early on. Um, the most common measure for assessing arterial stiffness, both with MRI and outside the use of MRI, is pulse wave velocity. Uh, the concept is, ra is rather simple, and it's shown on this uh, plot here on the left. I'm concentrating on the aorta. There are two measurement locations, and I purposefully left open how you measure. This could be an ultrasound sensor, could be, um, could be MRI. Um, you obtain a pressure waveform or a flow waveform, and um, since basically the systolic pulse is, um, is moving downstream uh, along the aorta, there will be a delay in these arrival times of those pr uh, pressure or flow waves. And if you know the delay, measured here as uh, delta T, um, and you measure the distance between those two measurement locations, you can derive pulse wave velocity as just the ratio of the length over the time delay. Um, the pulse wave velocity is also defined as the square root of uh, these couple of parameters here that includes the elastic modulus, uh, so that's a tissue property, vessel thickness, blood density, and the vessel radius. Um, 
the pulse wave velocity measure is the most validated method to non-invasively quantify arterial stiffness and has shown strong predictions of adverse outcomes, particularly in, in large population studies. Um, Here's an example of pulse wave velocity, both for uh, an elastic vessel, that's everybody in the room, you're all young athletes, 20 years, very healthy vessels. Uh, so there's, there's uh, basically the capacity uh, to, uh, to take up some of that pressure wave in the vessel wall, um, and it moves rather slowly through the body comparatively to uh, the, the other extreme, an infinite pulse wave velocity. I think of an iron pipe or so rigid body wall, that pul pulse wave velocity will travel extremely fast through the system. Just as a ballpark number for an adult middle age in the ascending order, pulse wave velocity is around four meters per second. Um, so this has been used in large studies uh, specifically uh, with applanation tonometry. So um, the idea is similar to what I just showed, but uh, the practical implementation uh, is slightly different. What you typically want to concentrate on is on the aorta, um, because there are significant changes or differences in the um, properties of the aorta compared to the more uh, peripheral vessels. Um, if you want to have access with a um, with a pressure sensor, uh, an external, like here, uh, you cannot focus only on the aorta. You're forced to use, in this case, the neck um, and the femoral artery as locations. And this is known as the carotid femoral pulse wave velocity. Um, so there are um, commercial products available to measure the delays, analyze that, and spit out pulse wave velocity um, readily for you. Uh, this is very easy and expensive and accessible, but it has a few drawbacks. Um, it includes the aorta and the peripheral arteries, as I already alluded to, um, and the stiffness and the effect of cardiovascular disease, which locally varies, um, will impact that globe, which is now a global measure, basically, uh, of um, stiffness of, of all of these vessels. Um, there are increased wave reflections from the peripheral arteries, which will negatively impact the results, uh, and there's flow in opposite directions um, going away from the heart, uh, upstream and downstream. Um, equally important, if not even more important, is that the, it's hard to get an accurate distance measure, which is very crucial to the proper pulse wave velocity measurement. So the way it's done practically is uh, that it's estimated from body surface area. Uh, so there's no 3D consideration. Um, vessels are not always straight. There are a couple of reasons why uh, uh, this is, can be erroneous and impact the results. Nonetheless, this is a very commonly used method. Um, and this can be conducted in a similar fashion with ultrasound sensors as well. Uh, but it also suffers from the lack of good 3D length measurements. And that's why MRI really has an opportunity to shine, because we inherently uh, acquire 3D angiograms in these exams. And we've heard this in prior talks. It's, it's, that's very readily available for us with or without contrast agents. And then we can conduct um, face contrast measurements. Um, and that was covered earlier today in Dr. Oechtering's talk. Um, 2D cine face contrast imaging, usually single breath hold, 20 seconds or less. Um, we can analyze the data uh, with region of interest drawing and get flow waveforms, uh, such as here. So with that in mind, we can now conduct measurements in multiple locations along the aorta, uh, in this case, um, to derive global and regional pulse wave velocity measurements. So uh, the, the advantages of, of MRI in this context are that we, can, that we get very accurate 3D length measures. Um, we can conduct the measurements in the target area. That could be the whole aorta or even segments of the aorta, uh, different from uh, the tonometry that also involves uh, carotid arteries and femoral arteries. Uh, the drawbacks of this approach is that we have a very limited temporal resolution compared to the measurements I mentioned before. Um, and that can indeed become a problem, especially when we want to do regional pulse wave velocity measurements. Um, and something that's not talked about so much is that we're really averaging over many cardiac cycles. Nobody truly investigated that, but it's not a real-time measure like we do with ultrasound autonometry. It's something, 20-second scans or 20 heartbeats or plus um, um, that we're averaging over that we're probably using also some additional temporal resolution with that smoothing. So um, let's assume we've acquired our data. How do we get from 2D phase contrast data to the actual pulse wave velocity measurement? There are multiple algorithms that have been proposed. Um, the one that's uh, most commonly used now, uh, because it's been shown in studies, like a study from Ibrahim here, that, that is uh, probably one of the most reliable methods, is the so-called time-to-foot method. In my example here, I'm going to show you just two planes that we're measured in. Um, the time-to-foot requires the establishment um, of the foot point of the waveform, and that is usually based on multiple measures along the upstroke of the um, 
of the pressure or flow waveform. Um, compared to time to peak, which is very intuitive and very simple to conduct, you're just looking at the location of the peak, but you're more sensitive to noise, uh, and it involves only a single time point measure, so uh, it's usually found to be less reliable. Uh, another approach is the cross correlation. Well, you basically uh, take the two waveforms measured in the two different locations to establish a uh, time delay. Uh, that works fairly well. Uh, and the time to upstroke is a derivative based measure of the um, pulse wave velocity. So, again, typical values for a healthy subjects is an order of four meters per second. Diseased subjects can be larger than seven seconds. It's also age dependent, it increases with age. So, um, it's not uncommon to have measurements uh, beyond 10 or 50 meters per second. Um, what are some potential pitfalls of conducting these pulse wave velocity measurements? So I alluded to the limited temporal resolution. Uh, there's a study from Sweden that shows that you need at least 30 milliseconds temporal resolution or better if you image the whole aorta. If you're now going into a regional assessment of the aorta, you have to be even faster than that. 30 milliseconds is probably not that much of a challenge, but going faster, for example, breaking the aorta into three, four segments, you have to go down to 10 milliseconds or less. That would be a challenge for most of our acquisitions uh, today, especially in a breath hold. Um, it's also challenging for shorter vessels. If you think of pulmonary artery, and I will show some examples of doing uh, such assessments in the cranial vasculature. Um, we we'll also want to mention some potential gating issues. Pulse oximeter gating is truly not an option. Um, there are long delays, so you might miss part of the cardiac cycle and inaccurate peaks. Um, we had in, in our, some of our initial studies, we had issues with the prospect of gating. Uh, that might be somewhat vendor dependent. I, I can't really say, but. Uh, like, uh, Ex uh, exaggerate this in the example on the upper left in that time plot, but there's basically a delay between the actual occurrence of the R wave and you're actually uh, triggering it. There's also a trigger window involved in that. So the plot here shows a retrospectively gated waveform in red and one of our early examples of a prospectively gated waveform. If you're missing that much um, of the upstroke, this was in the ascending aorta very close to the heart, uh, then your uh, analysis will be greatly compromised. Um, done with pitfalls, moving on now into some uh, methodology that was developed to improve on what we're doing for pulse wave velocity assessment. Here is, uh, again, from a study from Ibrahim et al. Um, from Detroit on cross-correlation at multiple locations. So here the idea is that you're involving scan planes at different locations, so their scan time goes up. Uh, you have um, multiple waveforms, despite the fact that your temporal resolution might not be truly sufficient uh, to resolve all these differences, the overall result, because you now have a, a set of eight or nine measurements of uh, pulse wave velocity, is more robust than if you just do two planes. You kind of almost see here, I think, in the data, these kind of discrete jumps because the temporal resolution is not sufficient uh, to, to truly resolve that step by step. But all, average over all these segments, it's st there's still a gain in robustness is what they found. Um, Here's a neat study uh, from the Netherlands, from Joe Westenberg, uh, who did 2D phase contrast encoding with in-plane, with two-directional velocity encoding. He did three slices, imaged those with extremely high temporal resolution, six to 10 milliseconds. Uh, you can see here. Uh, that resulted in 12 minutes scan times because he did three slices. Each slice took four minutes. Uh, but that allowed him for a, for a very um, distinct regional pulse wave velocity assessment. And he found that this measure had higher agreement with invasive pressure measurements than standard 2T PC pulse wave velocity measurements. I also like to point out uh, um, some of the 4D flow measurements or hemodynamic measurements that, that we are trying to assess, like wall shear stresses, so there is no gold standard. For pulse wave velocity measurements, there is a gold standard. You can, if you do invasive pressure measurements, for example, uh, and you, know, uh, an accurate, you have an accurate distance measurement, there is something true to compare with, and that's what people do in animals or in patients that are catheterized anyway. Um, so that was done in their study. Uh, here's another example um, that was also from the Netherlands, um, from Eva Peppers, uh, doing a very uh, accelerated 2D phase contrast imaging. In that particular case, she was interested in um, uh, pulse wave velocity in the carotid arteries. So there are the distances shorter. It also turns out that pulse wave velocity is higher. The vessels are stiffer to start with in that region. So a very high temporal resolution needed. They achieved that with compressed sensing, um, bring down the temporal resolution to somewhere in the order of five, four milliseconds shown here uh, in the column C. Um, the, the fastest method that I've seen is a method uh, that was introduced by the Oxford group by Valentina Taviani. Um, it's based on Fourier velocity encoding, M-based imaging. So it's kind of, 
missing spatial encoding uh, in all directions uh, and giving you profiles, but with extremely high temporal resolution. This is 3.5 milliseconds. Uh, here are now basically uh, snapshots uh, of these profiles that show you a similar wave front that we've seen before use similar methods again, for example, time to foot, uh, and can do an analysis um, uh, with that showed, was shown to be very robust and repeatable and also compared favorably with a gold standard. Here's a typical plot how, that's, uh, how the stiffness measures change with age, so that's, that's known that stiffness increases with age. And here's a more regional assessment uh, where you can see that the stiffness again changes um, with age, the 20 to 40, 40 to 60, and 60 to 8 year old age groups, and um, it also changes with location. Uh, that's what you see in the three different graphs in each one of them. So um, you need something like that very fast imaging to, uh, to conduct such um, analysis. The problem with that approach can be, that doesn't happen so often, but it does happen, uh, that you deal with tortuous vessels. This is an example here given to me by uh, the, the Markel group uh, when he was still in Freiburg, uh, of a patient where you see a, a significantly tortuous um, aorta. So now you're, you can't do this one directional encoding properly um, uh, for your profile, or you, don't, or you lose the track of the distance. Um, that also brings me to 4D flow imaging. Uh, we've heard about this in several talks previously, a very powerful method. Um, it allows um, vascular anatomy assessment, velocity fields, and secondary hemodynamic parameters, including vessel stiffness. I also call it the Swiss Army knife. I hope Matthias Stuber gets a kick out of that. But, uh, uh, it, 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 it's, really, it's a powerful tool, no doubt. Um, if I were to assess uh, pulse wave velocity, if that's my only goal, I might not choose that. I might choose something that has a higher temporal resolution because that's not the strength of 4D flow imaging, but often it's something that we can also acquire as a byproduct of our acquisition. So here's work again from the Markle group shown. Um, um, successful analysis uh, in, with similar results I've shown from the Taviani group. Uh, the uh, pulse wave uh, velocity increased with age and with, uh, and also in this case, with patients versus volunteers, but also with region. So 4D flow uh, is more suitable to adapt to tortuous vessels. Uh, it it uh, allows for comprehensive hemodynamic analysis, but it is a compromised temporal resolution because we are stuck with having to do analysis of, um, uh, we have to encode three velocity directions and a baseline, or a derivative of that. Um, Leonardo Rivera uh, from the Wisconsin group took it on himself to, to improve temporal resolution of 4D flow imaging. Um, he used constraint reconstruction with local row ranks and flow encoding splits to do that. Um, uh, and the purpose of his analysis was uh, to do 4D flow analysis in the uh, intracranial vessels. So here's an example showing the uh, LLR recon on top and the standard recon on the bottom, so much higher temporal resolution for the lower rank recon at the expense of more noisy signals. But you can see in the plot on the right uh, that the uh, time difference between waveforms one and two uh, was significantly decreased, so it allowed to resolve that difference uh, that truly existed, which wasn't uh, capable with a traditional encoding. Um, and here is a larger cohort study that he conducted in uh, over 100 patients uh, showing statistically uh, significant differences between controls and Alzheimer patients and also statistical differences in that group that's uh, multi-cognitively impaired, so kind of uh, on, possibly on the track uh, to uh, vascular dementia. Um, I think it's important to mention that robust processing tools are an important factor uh, in, 40 in this kind of pulse wave velocity analysis. And here's a neat tool that was recently published by a group in the Netherlands where everything is automated um, for segmentation and pulse wave velocity analysis, distance measures, etc. Uh, this would be great if we have that um, available across multiple sites for robust and repeatable analysis. I think I'm running out of time. I wanted to mention briefly that there are other methods than pulse wave velocity. There's something called the QA method, which you can do in a single plane. You don't need two plane measurements, um, where you measure the dis difference between the, the, the changes in flow and the changes in area during the upstroke of systole. Um, that brings me to my summary. Uh, I hope I showed you that aortic stiffness is a measure of clinical interest. It's a valuable surrogate um, of aortic stiffness, and MRI is very well suited to measure it. Um, there's been various methodologies to improve this. Um, 
uh, especially higher sp temporal resolution. Uh, what is really needed is larger scale multi-center MRI studies to show significance of these measures and streamlined analysis tools. I did not cover um, other algorithms in the context of uh, arterial stiffness, such as distensibility or cross-sectional area change or ML elastography. Uh, I focused on the ones that are derived from hemodynamic measurements. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, my group, my um, collaborators, people who contributed slides, and my funding agencies. Thank you. <laughs>